Should we? Okay, there we go. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to, um, to give a, a brief talk here. Um, I run a research group at the University of Oxford and have done for the past four years, been developing techniques to improve sight for people who are legally blind. And we've just finally produced our first portable system, which I was on demo down in the exhibition hall, and I've got, I've got one of them here, and you're more than welcome to try it out afterwards. Uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's not quite Google Glass in terms of its form factor, but it's got a much longer battery life. So let me give you a little bit of a description about why we, why we why research this problem, um, some of the developmental stages we've gone through and responses from people and things like that. Um, so in terms of blindness, I think the, the key thing to really get across is that the majority of people who are legally blind, so have registered blind, have a, a, a level of sight of 660 or less, have some remaining vision. So often are able to detect uh, you know, where a bright light's coming from and in certain scenarios have actually you know, perfectly good sight. But the limit comes uh, when you meet something with a, with a great deal of contrast. So if you've got like a, a person in front of a busy background, that person can completely disappear. Or in low light, people can actually become totally blind. So there's a lot of remaining sight left in the majority of people who are blind. There are something some 30 million people in the world who are totally blind, so it's, a, it's a quite a decent number of people to work for. What we started to look at is what type of problems people have and what, in what ways can you actually improve this? So the main issues faced by people who are blind is primarily the first one is driving, which is a real difficult one to deal with, but autonomous cars might be able to sort that one out. The second one is reading, and that's a real challenge because you can use screen readers to have newspapers read to you, but that's not really a natural interaction. The third one is recognizing faces, so recognizing expressions and having a meaningful relationship with somebody. And then the fourth one is what we all classically think about, which is uh, not bumping into obstacles, and hence the white cane or the guide dog. I became really interested in this question because I started, I was working in retinal prosthetics. So the idea that you can use cybernetics in order to understand uh, how you can improve sensors, particularly, uh, particularly sight, but vision as well. And retinal implants have got a, a limited success in a small number of areas, um, primarily because it's very hard to put an you know, implanted chip in the back of the eye and, and have it uh, persist for a long period of time. So I started to look at other ways in which we could use computer vision, primarily, to detect objects and make them easier to see for people who've got a small amount of sight. And so that really hit onto this idea about using smart glasses. About four years ago, we started to build our own wearable displays, but as you'll notice downstairs in the exhibition hall, there's a huge range now of quite socially acceptable um, visual displays that really can provide a, a, a great deal of sight in an augmented way. <coughs> so, so what we did, um, primarily how, how our system works, is the, the question was, what do you want to show someone? If someone's walking around, how do you What's the type of image that you need to detect and, and show to someone? And fortunately, around the time when we started to develop this, uh, the Kinect came out, so the depth uh, camera that's used in a lot of games. And that's really a structured light, well, that's actually a three-dimensional camera, so you can detect nearby objects and highlight them preferentially. And what that allows you to do is get rid of all the confusing background and make a display which is bright enough for you to see with a very, very small amount of sight and detect a face or detect an obstacle or in regions where it's very, very low light. You could detect uh, boundaries, t uh, trees, gutters, and things like that. So we developed, we started to test this with visual impairment, and um, right away there was there was a huge response from people who had things like glaucoma or retinitis pigmentosa, that they could finally use their remaining sight in really complex scenarios to detect in a really intuitive and naturalistic way uh, where an object is, where a, <laughs> a gigantic step off is. Um, and then finally we started to push this out a little bit and see what we could do actually with faces. And so doing a little bit of face detection and some really strong kind of contrast um, enhancement, we've learned a way to cartoonize a face, to make it look like, uh, like a stencil. Like we think, I don't know if you know the artist Banksy, who goes and you know, draws on walls and makes things look really cool. It kind of the same sort of stencil approach to that is really triggers the person's imagination. So I guess what we're trying to do really is produce an intuitive display, something that you don't really have to learn because I mean, a lot of people have done stuff with auditory devices or haptic devices, which are very difficult to learn. But this stimulates your mind, really, to, to pick up on details of a face or details of the environment, so you can use sight as you regularly do. We've ended up uh, testing this over the last couple of years, and about, uh, we've had about 80 people come through and look at different prototypes so far. And I think it's fair to say that around about 40% of people that we test have a clear benefit from this device. Last year, we applied for a Google Impact Challenge uh, with our collaborators at the RNIB, the Royal National Institute for Blind People, and won one of the four uh, prizes, which was really to take what we had as a lab-based prototype into something which is, you know, obviously extraordinarily attractive. And, um, 
able to be tested out in the real world because you've got a controlled environment is only so good for certain things. So this one now runs on Android, uses Epson's display underneath. So it's their Moverio see-through uh, display. We got a, a perfectly good Asus PrimeSense camera and chopped off all the bits we didn't want and stuck it into a, a, a normal system. And so you can just wear it like a, we actually don't call them smart glasses. I never said on there. We call it a visor now because it's not, they're not glasses. Yeah. But it just fits over the head. I actually haven't put this one on since all the people downstairs have, so I don't know what size it's got. And unfortunately, you can't see what I can see. But I can see, so what I can see is mostly it's dark in the background because everything's too far away for me to really worry about it right now. But you guys in front have this night bright, nice bright edges around you. And this podium stands out really uh, very, very strong. And my hands are quite good there. And you're welcome to try it out when, uh, when I'm finished. So I think what was what quite interesting and what we've always found in terms of getting feedback from people is that face detection is a huge benefit and it really is working very, very well. Uh, vision at night time is, is a huge problem and because this produces its own camera or its own light source, you can use it in complete darkness. And what I really like about it is that it's, um, it's a really practical use of see-through augmented reality. So I can see through this display. I've got a little sunglasses clip on there to make it better. And that's, um, and that's something that sometimes the AR field struggles with, is what's you know, one of the compelling use cases for why you want a, a see-through display with extra information on top. And when it comes to visual impairment, it's really clear. You know, this provides that sort of benefit. There are a couple of things, I guess, we're trying to work on in order to make this into a really viable product. One is that you can see this is see-through, and obviously you might think that's a, why would you want a see-through display, but I want this to be something that people are able to use really in their day-to-day -day life as much as possible. And people have done a previous work using VR headsets, so completely black, occluding all their eyes. And even if you don't have great sight, other people around you may, may well have perfect sight. And so having the ability to maintain eye contact means that you're not putting up this giant barrier to entry, which is going to lead people to either not use it or just use it on their own. The second one clearly is form factor. And while we're all trying to make great smart glasses, even, you know, even when Google made theirs, you know, there's almost nothing to it. It was still had a, you know, had a, an impression that was really hard to mistake. And that's something obviously we have an issue as well. Like we're trying to make something which is, uh, if you can't make it tiny, then at least make it kind of look good. That's kind of where we're at with that. And finally, this is a very simple device really just showing distance and allowing you to use your brain on top of it. But we run a research group in uh, the Department of Engineering at Oxford that does a great deal of actually higher level computer vision. So such as detecting objects, uh, learning 3D environments, and um, doing some work to try to let people understand the nature of objects in front. So rather than just presenting them, allow them to be on demand. So you can say, where's a chair? This place would be easy, you know. So where, where can I find a chair? Where's a, you know, a chair with nobody sitting on it? Where's the doorway to the restroom? Things like that. And these are all within the grasp of uh, computer vision these days. It's things like Project Tango and really excellent stuff based on 3D mapping. So a, real, a roadmap is really to put in a lot of this high level computer vision on top of a, a really well tested system. We're testing about 300 people in the UK over the next nine months. And at the end of that, that will give us the business case really to understand what's the scale of the market, what are the eye conditions that we can really help, and what type of computer vision and form factor is really acceptable. So hopefully you'll come back next year with something which is for sale, or at least, you know, on the verge of. And uh, yeah, help to, you know, sort of push this forward you know, for, for a lot of people. Thank you.